Okay, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce the luncheon speaker for us today, uh, Dr. Uh, Roderick Pettigrew, uh, PhD, MD. He's currently the Chief Executive Officer of Engineering Health, or NHealth, and the Executive Dean for the Engineering Medicine, or NMED, program at Texas A&M University in partnership with the Houston Methodist Hospital. Dr. Pettigrew also holds the endowed Robert A. Welch Chair in Chemistry. NHealth is the nation's first comprehensive educational program to fully integrate engineering into an all health related disciplines. And NMED is the nation's first four year fully integrated engineering and medical education curriculum leading to both an MD and a master's degree in engineering. An internationally recognized leader in biomedical imaging and bioengineering, Dr. Pettigrew served as the first director of the National Institute of Biomedical uh, Imaging and Bioengineering at the National Institutes of Health. Prior to the, his appointment at the NIH, he joined Emory University School of Medicine as a professor of radiology and Georgia Institute of Technology as a professor of bioengineering. He is well known for pioneering four-dimensional imaging of the cardiovascular system using magnetic resonance imaging. In addition to his numerous achievements, he is an elected member to both the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering. After receiving his Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Morehouse as a Merrill Scholar, Dr. Pettigrew attended Rensselaer Polytech Institute, where he earned his Master of Science degree in Nuclear Science and Engineering. He received his PhD in Radiation Physics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and attained his medical doctorate from Leonard M. Miller School of Medicine at the University of Miami. We're really very proud and delighted that Dr. Pettigrew has joined us at the campus in College Station uh, at Texas A&M University. So please uh, help me welcome him. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, delighted to be here. Uh, a little bit not so surprised with the audiovisual challenges that we had, which have delayed us a few minutes, so I'll have to try and speed up a bit. I was just telling Bonnie, who I want to thank for this uh, kind invitation to join you and to be a part of this unique experience here as we talk about uh, deep space exploration and space medicine. Uh, but despite having given many, many, many talks, it's uh, still not too surprising that periodically we have these, these technical challenges. Um, and we had those today. So consequently, I will not be able to do and speak about absolutely everything that I wanted to, but I'll try and hit the, the highlights. I do want to take a moment to just uh, share with you that while I'm just joining the uh, Texas A&M and Houston Methodist family this year in 2018, this is not my first uh, experience with or exposure to Houston and specifically to NASA. Like many of you and those uh, astronauts, that uh, amazing panel of historic astronauts that we had yesterday, I took many photos and sent them to various people around. Uh, I, I too was inspired by the space challenge that was laid before the nation by President Kennedy uh, as a preteen in rural deep south in Albany, Georgia. And uh, I had a, a natural interest for some reason in things that would fly. I didn't would state that my goal was to be an aeronautical engineer, didn't quite achieve that goal, but uh, got interested in engineering. Uh, and somewhere along the way, uh, this continued, and it was a, a bit ironic that when the space shuttle landed on the moon, I found myself as a physics student during the summer, when this happened during the summer, uh, on a campus of Columbia University and laboratory headed by Madam Wu, who some of you may or may not have known was a famous physicist who had overturned one of the principles of physics at that, particle physics at that time called parity. Um, also, I happened to be here when the shuttle, uh, Challenger shuttle, was first delivered to NASA. I was at NASA watching it 
being amazed knowing nothing about it and seeing it fly in piggyback on the top of the 747, which for me was an amazement and sort of wondering how that could happen. I did that with uh, a dear, actually my best friend, who was an astronaut, and I was his guest and visited him then, and he said, hey, Rod, you wanna go watch uh, this new shuttle come in and it's the, the challenge is coming in today? I said, sure. Well, that person was Ron McNair, who uh, many of you, if not all of you know and remember, and, um, so I, uh, Ron indeed was, was my best friend then, and I stayed in touch with his uh, widow, Cheryl, since the uh, explosion of the Challenger, which I watched on TV when I was a physician at Emory. So what I'd like to share with you now was introduced uh, by Bonnie as this bold new educational research and hopefully transformative impact venture that we're undertaking at Texas A&M in partnership with Houston Methodist called InMed. I uh, will describe this a bit more, but I wanted to do it in the context of talking about emerging technologies for space medicine. Since in fact, uh, InMed is poised to play a role in developing more of these emerging technologies for space medicine. Uh, this concept of converging the quantitative sciences and the biological sciences for the purpose of improving our, our understanding of health and disease and how best to uh, meet these is not new. You can see this quote uh, from April of 2002 in Technology Review, Biology and Engineering Beginning Across Paths. This was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 16 years ago. At their intersection could come remarkable advances, and this is a key thing, advances in the understanding and then from that understanding, treatment of disease. This crosstalk between biology and engineering cited 16 years ago. And then just three years ago, actually the same month, uh, April 2015, I with several co colleagues who also are bioengineers, Xu Chen, Rashid Bashir, and Bob Niram. Uh, no doubt many of you know Bob Niram as a senior professor at Georgia Tech wrote this piece in Science Translational Medicine, positing engineering as a new frontier for translational medicine, and making the observation that uh, we're all about here on planet, on, on the planet, higher quality health care, while uh, containing costs and increasing access, these are competing um, challenges, certainly uh, here, that they would be best, by, best met by integrating engineering into medicine and medicine into engineering until boundaries vanish. That was, uh, I think, take home message from this article. This blending, this merger, this convergence until there are no boundaries, which is the way it is in nature. There is no separation between physics and chemistry and, and the language of science, math, uh, they're all seamlessly interwoven. So we think that our best shot for meeting our most daunting challenges is to actually learn these fields the way they are in nature. Uh, that is true here on Earth and no doubt would be applicable to meeting the challenges beyond Earth and into space. So it is not surprising then that a forward-looking institution like Texas A&M would see that this needs to be done in a more purposeful way. The quote that I showed you from Technology Review in April of 2002 said, 
they're beginning to cross paths. And indeed, that was happening, but it was happening sort of after the fact, serendipitously at some time. Sometimes engineers and phys physicians would find each other because they had mutual interests. The intent here is a purposeful blending at the very beginning, which is with education of these uh, two fields, engineering and medicine. So what is in med and innovative engineering medical school, MD and master's in engineering four year program. That is students will earn both degrees in four, in four years. The purpose is to educate an engineering grounded physician. This is a new undertaking, a new entity. And so we have a new name for this new kind of brain that's gonna come out of this educational experience, this blended experience with this blended name, a physicianeer. The focus is training physicianeers to be inventive, uh, to solve medical problems, not just diagnose uh, and treat them. So the focus is on the invention of transformational technology. Uh, this was picked up by this online uh, newspaper. You can see here where your next doctor be a physician here. Every in-med graduate will earn these two degrees in four years. They'll learn research and commercialization principles but to ground this goal of creating an invention-minded physician, we actually will require all of the students to invent something before graduation to improve health or health care. Uh, this will occur right here in Houston, just a stone's throw from where we are now, uh, in partnership with Houston Methodist Hospital, and Houston Methodist Research Institute, you see the two buildings there. We have space being renovated just as we speak within the Methodist Hospital and an additional building uh, on Holcomb Bridge, on Holcomb Road, uh, will be renovated uh, as well that will become the eventual home for InMed opening that building in 2020. The outlay of the curriculum is shown here and not to go through it, but just to make the point that in green is traditional medical courses in purple or engineering courses and that on a week by week, day by day basis, the students will be learning them both. The idea is to take the same material from which one learns to diagnose and treat disease and from that extract engineering lessons. And that's how you earn these two degrees in four years. Now, if we look at the kinds of challenges uh, that you have been discussing, we have been discussing the last uh, couple of days, uh, as succinctly summarized here, uh, when I was at uh, NIH and I first met Craig Kundrat, uh, he had this list of 30 challenges that needed to be addressed and for deep space uh, travel. And I see that they have now been coalesced into these five areas uh, that are uh, more addressable or palatable and, and certainly understandable. And no time to talk about each of these, but I thought I would highlight some of the advances that are occurring that might be applicable to helping us address some of uh, these uh, uh, challenges and problems uh, a as outlined here. And just a, a couple of examples. So <laughs> Kevin, if you can get ready for the video, uh, th this is what took us so long. But this is an organ on a trip, so th uh, on a chip. This is a complete human breathing lung on a chip. It simulates what you see there, an alveolar a sac that is an interface between a capillary and an air sac, um, and also with the physiologic uh, nature of a lung, with the expansion and contraction of a lung, all of this being simulated uh, on this chip so that uh, a variety of experiments can be done and we can understand <coughs> how to address some of the challenges associated with breathing in disease. 
And the video that I'm going to show you is one of the challenges that, that's uh, addressed when one gets an infection. When uh, you uh, inhale something that is, is infectious and you see what happens there and how best to treat it. And the impact of respiration actually on infection. Something I didn't appreciate before the take home message is that ventilators actually modulate the permeability of the lung and therefore the extent to which infection occurs. Kevin, if you can roll the audio, I have the video the going. The chip is crystal clear, flexible, and about the size of a small computer memory stick. But it contains tiny hollow channels created using microchip fabrication techniques. A porous, flexible membrane separates the two channels at the center of the device. The opposite sides of the membrane are lined by human lung and capillary blood vessel cells. This mimics the arrangement of lung and blood vessel cells in the air sac of the lung. Application of cyclic suction in side channels makes the entire flexible sheet and cells stretch and relax rhythmically, just like our lung cells do when we breathe. In the lung on a chip device, air flows over the top of the human lung cells and a liquid medium containing human white blood cells flows below the capillary cell layer. To test how well the lung on a chip device replicates the natural responses of living lungs, we introduce bacteria into the air channel to mimic an infection. And we introduced white blood cells to the blood channel. We then saw the white blood cells migrate across the capillary cell layer, through the pores of the central membrane, and into the airspace where they engulfed the bacteria. Here's a video that shows this response in real time viewed through the device. The tissue cells are not visible here, but we can see white blood cells flowing freely in the capillary channel of the device, just as they do in blood vessels of a healthy person. But when we infect the air channel by adding bacteria, the immune cells abruptly stick to the surfaces of the capillary cells on the opposite side of the membrane, located directly below the infection site. Here's a magnified view showing a migrating white blood cell, making its way through the first capillary cell layer, wriggling through the pentagonal hole in the flexible membrane, and then moving out of focus to the other side. When viewed from the air channel, with all cells visible, you can see a round white blood cell popping up from below. Just like in a real lung infection, the white blood cells, which are now colored red, engulf and kill the clean bacterial invaders. Okay, uh, and here is a graphic uh, that shows how an intervention was discovered using this approach. Uh, one of the problems in treating uh, uh, patients with cancer with a drug shown here called interleukin-2 is that it results um, in edema of the lung. And that's being shown by these green markers that mark the uh, edematous level. And when interleukin-2 is present, these uh, markers which are fluorescent are found in the lung uh, tissue, though injected in the capillary. And the level of fluorescence is shown here in this graphic. It, it then is a marker of the permeability of the lung. Uh, consequent to the changes that happen, the side effects that happen with this drug interleukin-2. The good news then is that this particular uh, inhibitor of TRPV4, which is a gene that codes for the expression of the cation channel that modulates the permeability of the capillary and alveolar uh, interface. When, once that is inhibited, then the fluorescence is diminished meaning that the permeability and therefore the edematous edem side effects are uh, counter, uh, uh, countered with this inhibitor. And this as a treatment for the side effect of interleukin-2 was then discovered using this lung on a chip. So those kinds of studies uh, could be done with other models. There are uh, models for virtually every organ now. 
I uh, fast forward uh, to this advance in which we're now able to image the functional pathways of the brain. Um, and not only image them, but began to understand how the brain is not only wired, but what that wiring means. And the extent to which it controls things like memory, even emotion, emotional liability, um, uh, for example, seem to be predictable based on wiring patterns. This, uh, these are images that were obtained uh, by Van Wedeen and his colleagues at, at MGH using a fundamental technique called diffusion tensor imaging uh, in which the pathways that are beautifully shown here in the brain in this um, uh, color-coded uh, diagram that you, sh that you see here where colors uh, actually represent direction. You can sort of green as go front to back and red as from left to right. Uh, but those fiber tracks, so-called tractography, are not directly visualized or directly imaged with MRI. They're actually computed. And they are computed using uh, this uh, diffusion tensor uh, methodology which resolves motion in 300 isotropic directions, or it has the, the ability to resolve motion in 300 isotropic directions. And the tracks are based on the observation that water diffuses along an axon. So if we watch the diffusion and the direction of the diffusion over these 300 isotropic possibilities, and from that, trace out the diffusional pathways of water, and from that, then compute these tracks. Uh, when you think about the sophistication of that methodology and the computational heft involved in doing it, it's pretty amazing that we can resolve these tracks with the kind of fidelity that you see here. From uh, these tracks now, a number of things have been learned. What I've just showed you was the uh, pathways as computed by diffusion tensor, or specifically diffusion spectral imaging when you look at all these things in different directions. Are these tracks shown by Peter Basser, uh, who actually invented this technique in the, in the early 90s? And what he's showing now are tracks where the color does not represent direction, but actually represent the speed of conduction. This is a first to look at tractography or tracks within the brain where you're uh, uh, identifying the relative rate of speed of conduction in them, and it's called latency mapping, and showing that in, in, this, in this normal uh, individual has a uh, differential range of about an order of magnitude, you can, as you can see. Imagine having this and being able to study individuals uh, under a variety of conditions with a variety of interventions and seeing uh, the variation from norm and how interventions can return an individual to, to norm, uh, whether it's anxiety, obsessive compulsive uh, disorder, et cetera, and so forth. And these researchers from Yale have made this uh, interesting finding that if you divide the brain up into the 250 or so known areas, functional areas uh, that we all have, and look at the correlation of those areas in time in terms of the level of activation, uh, establish this uh, correlation map, which gives you the functional connectivity within an individual between all of these different regions, that for each of us, that connectivity map is unique. It is so unique that it is referred to as a fingerprint, a brain fingerprint. And this fingerprint analysis they demonstrated was uh, sufficiently unique that they had about a 98% accuracy in, uh, in picking people out once this connectome map was uh, established for a given individual. The other uh, take home point here was that it also seemed to correlate or did correlate with fluid intelligence, 
where fluid intelligence is a capacity shown here for reasoning on the spot, uh, discerning patterns and solving problems independent of acquired knowledge. Uh, the fact that with the connectome uh, for each of those individuals, they observed a correlation between those uh, and the uh, performance on these fluid intelligence tests to the point that you, one could then, in another cohort, predict how one would perform on such a test based on basically how the brain is wired. Because of uh, uh, the time uh, and so forth here, I am just going to summarize here, Bonnie, with just a take-home message from two slides. And this one, just uh, uh, to point out that a smartphone approach to molecular diagnosis of cancer has been established in such a way that a diffraction images of a sample placed on a slide, illuminated by light, clipped onto a cell phone with those diffractional uh, images sent into the cloud wirelessly, uh, then reconstructed into the cells that actually produce them, and even cells that have been labeled with uh, immune beads, such as to be able to identify cancer cells that have specific genetic markers, whether those markers are present and even the quantity to which they are present, so that one could then identify, as shown here, these breast cancer cells and the extent to which they express the cancer biomarkers shown here. All done remotely at the point of care and the potential to do this, I think even in space, uh, is there. I won't talk about virtual reality, we all know that. Uh, just a quick uh, observation. Um, someone asked me yesterday whether or not it was true that that in the future we may replace stethoscopes with uh, a, a microphone that you could plug into a cell phone and, and, and visualize a heart. This is true. So it was the first introduced in 2010. It was uh, basically the top uh, innovation award of the year. Uh, it's, this was the size of the first one by GE. It's now gotten down to about this size. And there's another company for $5,000 called Butterfly uh, that's producing such a device at the cost of about $2,000. And this just to, to point, to make the point that the potential for vaccinating a person against cancer and developing a cancer is, has been demonstrated in mice. By ejecting these uh, nano rods that uh, have uh, within them chemicals that attract dendritic cells, dendritic cells are cells that present an antigen to a T cell, the T cells are cell, our immune cells that kill cancer cells. If you do that and inject a person with these uh, rods, they self-assemble into this construct that you can see here, recruit the dendritic cells. If you also put in a, an antigen to a specific, for a specific uh, cancer in a small amount, it then recruits in T cells and you have uh, a, a, a system that is sensitized to this type of cancer cell. It has the army of T cells that combat it and been shown effective, effective in both reducing, eliminating uh, tumors in mice once being vaccinated and also being, upon being challenged again with being re-inoculated with these cancer cells, preventing those cancer cells from growing. So very optimistic about that and the potential to help and vaccinate us against some of these challenging illnesses. I end with this quote, history has taught us that striving for the impossible is a necessary precondition for achieving the possible. This audience dreams this way as, as I do. This is one of my favorite thoughts and thinking. I close with this. This is what we will be teaching our students at Texas A&M and Houston Methodist in the NMED program um, to do, how to think, and how to strive for addressing the kinds of challenges 
that need to be addressed in order for us to extend the boundaries that we've uh, reached already uh, in space exploration. I thank you for your attention. Well, Doctor, unfortunately, we're going to, uh, in the interest of time, go to the next session, but Dr. Pettigrew is going to be around and happy to answer your questions. I know that there are already some interest in making some connections. So uh, with that, uh, I've been given the wind-em-up sign, so we'll uh, go into the, the auditorium. Thank you. <laughs>